Hey y'all, how are you doing? I'm great, thank you so much for asking. It's me, Kim, and I'm back for another video. This video is an interview with Kashawn Thompson. You might not know this, but Kashawn originated the phrase black girls are magic, which became black girl magic. And if you don't know that, you should. Kashawn has been intentionally erased from this incredible thing that she created. It spawned a movement. It spawned so much self-reflection and community among black women. And I think that the way that she has been treated over these years has been truly despicable really, really horrible. So I talked to Kashan about how she came up with Black Girls Are Magic, how that turned into a movement, how she has not been the person who has primarily profited from this movement, and how, you know, a lot of times it be your own people. A lot of Black women have contributed to her erasure. So here's our conversation. Thank you for taking some time to talk to me. Like you said, it's been a minute. We would try to get it together. I know for like two years at least. <laughs> yes. um, but I do think that this is like an interesting time to talk about really what you created and the, the legacy of it. Uh -huh. So um, I guess the first thing that I wanted to kind of get into was the origins of Black Girls Are Magic. What was happening when you decided to tweet that out? Well, I, um, what was happening at the time, and it had to be been like, 2013 for some reason there was like this the this overwhelming opinion that black women were like the worst things on the planet and not that people hadn't had those opinions before but because of social media it was becoming amplified I mean, it seemed like every time I logged on there was like some negative something swirling around black women so um I think that was the year that guy had written that article for psychology today saying that we were like the most unattractive beings on the planet. Scientifically most unattractive. Scientifically. Yeah. Scientifically, you know, you know, cause science. And, um, so it was that. And I think that might've been around the same year that, uh, some study came out saying that we had the most cases of STDs and Steve Harvey was really getting his rocks off talking about how we were unmarriageable and a lot of that was going on. And then I think that I know for a fact the thing that pushed me to tweet it was I, I logged on the Twitter and somebody said that Serena Williams looked like a man. And she looked like a man. And, she, and it was because of her manly extra testosterone, whatever, is that she was beating everybody. And that's why she was beating everybody. I was, I, you, know, you know, despite the fact that she's like the greatest living athlete mm -hmm. right now, it was because she looked like a man. Right. It's so, so funny because I have been tweeting about this and having conversations about this. Social media was not always like it is now. There was, no. a, there was a time when it was normal, routine for everybody, even people who we see as woke today, to get right. in on shitting on black women, basically. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I, I try to remind people, like, look, it, it wasn't always like it is in 2020. There was a time where, you like, dudes was getting famous. You know, all for shit on black women. Yes, yes, like that was their thing. And yeah, then they, they was getting like, oh yeah, they was they you know then they read a couple books or you know got married or had a baby girl or something and then there they woke. Yes, but seven, eight, ten years ago they would log on and say the worst shit about black women and you know get a hundred follows a day off of it. Right. Oh, the rebrands, the twenty twenty rebrands, I find to be yeah. so frustrating. Okay. Yeah. Because I remember when. Yes. If you have been on Twitter, I've been on Twitter for like 10 years. If you, you, Me too. You know. You know. Okay. Yes. So um, you tweeted it out. And what was the response? Like, the, the response was like overwhelming. And what happened was somebody said to me, and this was at the height of everybody going to Teespring and making t-shirts. And they were like, if you put that on a t-shirt, I'll buy it. And I, I laughed it off. And then maybe a couple days later or something, I said, maybe I should. So I thought about it and I, I knew exactly how I wanted it to look. Like I don't have any graphic design skill at all, but I knew exactly how I wanted it to look. So my best friend was um, living with me at the time because my daughter was gone to college and um, I didn't want to be in an apartment by myself, but <laughs> she was living with me at the time. And she does, um, she's a graphic designer. So I said, well, can you make it look like this? Can you use this font? And this is what it means to me. And this is why I want to look like this. And I sat down, you know, and showed her all the examples and talked to her about the concept because we had been talking about it a lot since I had tweeted it out. And so she 
put that design together, the one that's on the original T-shirt, and I put it out there, you know, and I thought it would be, oh, this would be fun. Me and, you know, my internet homegirls or whatever will wear the shirt and it'll be cool. And so I said, well, I'll sell about 30 shirts. That'd be fun. And that first round, I sold 300 wow. shirts. Yeah. And I, like, wow, like I, I never thought so many people would connect with it the way that they did. But I think in that moment, it was something that we needed. You know, yeah. and that's why so many like connected with it the way that they did. And I've had so many messages and everything. People telling me, thank you for like giving us a way to celebrate ourselves. Just us. Mm-hmm. No- nothing extra. We don't have to bring nobody in and all that kind of stuff. So that's really how it started. Yeah. So how did Black Girls Are Magic evolve into Black Girl Magic? When did you see that happening? Um, it just turned into that um, not long after it happened, it went there because back then was when we had that little bit of, you know, 140 characters. Yeah. So it just got and it was just because of that. No other reason. Yeah. Because it was it was mostly used on Twitter and it just got truncated to fit Twitter. Mm-hmm. When so. when you saw it kind of starting to take off, did you have in your mind any idea of like, I'm going to try to brand this other than the merchandise or like, um, how am I going to? Yeah. Nope. I never did. And and I only did it because people urged me to it. They thought I was like, you know, giving up the bag or whatever like that. But when I did it, that wasn't that wasn't the point of it. Right. That was never the point. You know, and I made a little bit of money off of it, but it really was a gift to me. It was something that I was giving to black women because I felt like we needed it. Mm-hmm. You know? I- so it was never a thing where, oh, I'm going to make a million dollars. I'm going to, you know, license these products and all that it that was never my intention but now that you see that so many people are profiting off of it do you feel any type of way about that sometimes I mean for a little while I did like for a little while I would say for about a good year it just was under my skin that bothered me so much but I noticed just like in the last two years I'm like "Eh, well you know what I can't control this I can't make anything happen it's out there. It was like the genie in a bottle or whatever, whatever. And you can't put it back in. Yeah. You, can't, you can't unspill the milk. So, yeah. I mean, but this is interesting to me because we do see instances where some people are able to brand their hashtag that they create and mm-hmm. make profitable businesses or pivot new careers. And it, yeah. it is a little strange to me that like, you are not one of those people who we can point to as like this huge success story. And why, why do you, do you have any ideas on why you think that is? Well, I definitely think it's because I wasn't the right kind of woman to be saying these things about black women. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't like, you know, the college grad. I didn't have, you know, the sorority sister ties. I didn't have the money, you know, when I did this, I was poor, divorced, single mother, I don't even think I had a job. Well, yeah, I had a job when it happened, but you know what I'm saying? It was a lot of it had to do with, excuse me, a lot of it had to do with like just who thought that, uh, who thought that I was worthy of the credit, Right. you know? Yeah. So, and then I was older. I wasn't exactly a girl. Like Mm -hmm. I did black girl magic the year I turned 40. Like Mm -hmm. a lot of great things happened to me that year. But, um, yeah, I think it had a lot to do with, like, maybe respectability. Yeah. And yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Because as it went on and it got connected, you know, first of all, it became commodified. Once it became, uh, it, and then after that commodification, it was easy to, like, you know, turn it from a state of being to a thing that you own. Like, all commodities. Like, all things on the internet. Right. So... Once it ha- that happened, it was hard for me to get it back. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was hard for me to get it back. And that mattered for a little while. But now it doesn't matter as much. Right. You know, I would love to, you know, profit the way other people have profited. Because at the end of the day, we all need some money. Right. And I need some money. You know, I got my children are grown. I got married. I got extra children. I got four grandchildren, one on the way. I need some money. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> but. I don't know. I don't know if I'm if I'm spiritually invested enough to go chase that bag like that. Mm-hmm. Like, like I'm super satisfied with the life that I have now. Like, I got a great 
husband. I got great kids. My grandbabies are adorable. I'm working in the field that I always wanted to be in. I love where I work and I love the work that I do there. So I don't know if it's, it's important to me to like do all that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's out there and people know how I feel about it and people know what I meant for the most part, I guess. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think something that is a little tricky here and people who have been, I've been following you for a long time and you were an early supporter of for Harriet. And I think that something that is a little bit tricky is when it's other black women who are participating in the erasure. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That, that bothers me because I did it for us. Yeah. You know, and for them to like go out of their way to cut me out or um, treat me as an afterthought once they've done all this stuff, because this lady did a whole academic text, I guess. And she was like, oh, you're in this book. So, and Black Girl Magic's on the cover. I'm going to send you a, a, a book. So I felt like that was a big, like, after the Yeah, yeah. But there's but there's all kinds of, I mean, there's books and there's conferences and there's... Girl, and there's wine and uh, I can't go nowhere now. What I was in a beauty supply store about a month before all this stuff popped off. And I saw a T-shirt that I know was made in China that said Black Girl Magic. You yeah. know, so. Yeah. But like I said, I just feel like it's a thing that got away from me. It became much, it was always bigger than me. But yeah. it was something bigger than any aspirations or understandings that I had about it. Like, it, it turned into a thing that actually alienated women like me. Right. Oh, that's, and, ooh, that's interesting. And, yeah, it, it did. It turned into a, thing, into a thing that actually alienated women like me. And I had to go back and like, write a whole like blog post about every day black girl magic i had to like clarify like wait a minute what y'all not going to do is talk down on single moms y'all not going to do is talk down on minimum minimum wage worker um, black women what you're not going to do is talk down on those of us who now got never got around to finishing college y'all not going to y'all not going to do that yeah you know yeah. so and poor black women like from the hood and the girls are with it nails long and, you know, the big, you know, bamboo earrings. Y'all not going to do that because that's me, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. I, it feels like Black Girl Magic has kind of become something like Black excellence, right? Where we only imagine it yeah. as being a very narrow kind of ex- excellence or we only want to celebrate a very narrow kind of magic. And it's quite ironic that you are the antithesis of that. We should be going to you to lead us to what, right. yeah. But for some reason, um, and I think a lot of it had to do with people not knowing that the, it originated with me. Um, they just, they don't ask me. Yeah. Like few, like some people have. Like, I appreciate people like uh, Feminista Jones, who like definitely interviewed me for an entire chapter of her book when she wrote the book about, um, you know, hash, I mean, online activism for black women. Like she came to me, you know. Outside of the fact that we had known each other for a while, she she knew that I could give her the answers that she needed, you know, explanations she needed. And um, I did a talk. It's been two years. It's really been two years since I did anything, like, significant around it. But I did something at a, a community college over here about um, about Black Girl Magic. And then um, BET interviewed me for a research project they were doing with Twitter around black hashtag activism and that kind of thing. But generally people come up with these conferences and they come up with these girls groups and different things. And they don't even like when people talk about it now, I think Moya Bailey like highlighted me on her Twitter account recently and people were like, Oh, I didn't know that was you. That is so, you know, this is fascinating because we are in this moment where black folks and black women in particular are asserting on social media, like, this is our stuff, give us our credit, don't Side appropriate, sister. Side and sister, don't appropriate, right. like, pay us. And this movement that you, that came out of your brain, or you popularized it. I saw an interview that you did with Feminista Jones, and she said maybe somebody else had used it before, but you definitely... But the thing about it is nobody used it before in the way that I used it. Right. Like, nobody. Like, BET even pulled up the first... The first first time the hashtag was used in the way that I use it, it was me. They said they found a couple instances where it was used in like what in a in reference to black women's hair, mm-hmm. 
but no one before me had done it, you know, the way that I did it. Mm -hmm. So now we're in 2020 and we've seen what's happened with Black Girls Are Magic. We saw saw what happened with Peaches Monroe with like on fleek and all of that kind of stuff. Do Mm -hmm. you have any regrets about not taking different action or trying to copyright or trademark or anything like that? I don't. And I don't have any because I know what position I was in at the time. Right. I rem- I didn't know what to do. I had like the only way I ended up even getting uh, legal representation when I did a few years back was because someone else had taken on up the mantle of look, you know, because Sean is not getting her credit. She gave y'all this and y'all just running with it. And y'all ain't saying her name. Y'all ain't paying her nothing. Da, 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 da. And so an uh, IP lawyer who's now a good friend of mine. He took it up, like he took me on pro bono to, you know, do branding, get me like speaking gigs and all that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> had me a website built, uh, worked on the copyright stuff because the the biggest obstacle was that was with Beverly Bond anyway. But um Oh, okay. So this is okay, well let's let's so that would be um Black Girls Rock. Yeah. And and Be- Beverly Bond is the founder of Black Girls Rock, and yeah. she was trying to trademark Black Girl Magic or Black Girls right. Are Magic. Yeah. Okay. So, and I, I think I remember this day on Twitter where somebody pulled up the receipts on that. And so when you found that out, was she immediately receptive to saying, my bad, <laughs> basically? No. Mm-mm. And I found it out before then. Oh. My daughter, my daughter actually had done a Google search while she was at college and called me to talk to me about it because I had I didn't know about it at all. <clears throat> and of course, I felt intimidated. I'm like, Beverly Bond, what am I what am I going to do against her? How can I I can't handle this? And I remember not having a job, but I had gotten my tax refund money back and taking six hundred dollars of my money and trying to do like some online something, something with intellectual property. I had no idea what I was doing, you know, at all. But I knew that it, I had to do something right. because, oh, God, Beverly Bond. If I had known, like, if I had been in contact with the intellectual, proper, uh, intellectual uh, property lawyer that I eventually worked with, it would have gone a whole different way. Right. But it just went the way that it did based on the fact that I didn't know. Right. I didn't know nothing, and I didn't have no resources. Yeah. I'm in D.C. on my couch you know, babysitting here and there to kind of keep myself afloat with two kids, one in college, and she's barely bond. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> so so I, it just went that way because I didn't have the resources or really any working knowledge. I had to make it go any other way. And I think the reason that it is how it is now is because the ship had basically sailed yeah. Yeah. by the time I was able to do anything. Yeah. You know, I got somebody on my team that could help me out. Has she been in contact that, with you? Mm-mm, she, she never has. Like, she has never, none of her people, nothing. She oh, won't even talk to me. Wow. Yeah, that's so unfortunate that we do that to each other. That yeah. is so upsetting to me. It's, okay, um, so I, I th- what I wanted to say was, like, you know, people, when these things go viral, people are always like, well, you should have trademarked it. And you should yeah. have protected your stuff. And it's like, first of all, you got to have money to do that. Right. And not only do you have to have money to do it, but you have to have money to protect the trademark. Like, people just be saying stuff, you know. Like- they don't know. <laughs> it's not easy. It's so hard. And I don't even know the answer out of it because I would talk to my lawyer and he was like, look, Kashan, I'm explaining this to you. It's easy. I can't because trademark law is a beast. So he would explain it to me. I would say, just give me the facts, the the very layman, you know, preschool level facts on this. Mm-hmm. And that, because it is so much, right. like it is so much. Like if you don't have a lawyer that actually knows intellectual property law, you are screwed, yeah. period. Yeah. You know, do you think it's even something that you could have ever owned? Like, or do you just think if the idea it took off and the way that black women run social media, it was always going to spread like wildfire. I think I could have owned it. I do think I could have owned it if I had had other motives when I came up with it. Yeah. And I think because my motives were so pure was what made it easy to permeate the atmosphere. Like if it had been like this, you know, crafted, carefully crafted and constructed um, brand um, launch or something like that, I would have owned it before I said it, you know, but it wasn't that. 
it was like I said, that was never my intention. So because it was so what I want to call it's like it. organic. It was so it's organic. Yeah. It's ephemeral. It's I wanted it to belong to everybody. Yeah, you know. But and the fact that people were trying to trademark it and people are like, you know, branding their wine and their this and their that on it makes it look like it doesn't. And then when people started attaching to people who were only like Michelle Obama or Tracy Ellis Ross yeah. or, you know, those luminaries, it makes it look like it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like I feel like the best thing I could have done was to um, to just make sure everybody knows, like, first of all, it might be this thing, you know, it may look like this thing. But let me tell you from yeah. my heart where it came from, my brain, where it came from, it's not just that thing. Yeah. You know. It includes all of us. Right. It has to. Like, how could it not? No. Yeah. I mean, it's so unfortunate that, like, now in 2020, everything is a product. I mean, I don't know. I feel like people don't. 2013 seems like not that long ago, but it also seems like an eternity ago. It's like really before we really knew, like, really, really. Like, this is before Oscars So White and, like, all of that. It's like we didn't really know. Oh, no. There's no way you Mm could have known. Mm Mm-mm. Yeah. Do you think that this is a movement that can be sustained? I think it's a movement that can be and should be. Like, yeah. it's essential. You know, just because we not we may not be feeling like the wave right now as far as the heavy critique and, the you know. But it's everything that was happening in 2013 when I was sitting on the Internet, it's still happening. It's still yeah. happening. It's I mean, the penalties haven't gotten less. You know. you know, it's so OK. So it's so fascinating because on one hand, I do think that the strength of black women's voices on the Internet has been kind of amplified in recent years. But there is also I mean, there is still definitely like deep misogynoir. Oh, and we've mm-hmm. also seen I don't know if this is like a good thing or not, but we have <laughs> seen some prominent kind of men kind of be run off of Twitter after right, they said, because- yeah. Yeah, and we I definitely have. I don't really <laughs> have a problem with that, right? Like, I don't either. <laughs> like that's a good thing, and I do think that's a, like a positive development from where we were back in 2013. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say that um, some have been run off, but it's like weeds. Yeah, like, it's like weeds. You pull up one, and the next day I'm looking at my yard because I did it. You pull up one, and <laughs> two seconds plays. Yeah, you know. Yeah, but yeah. they they are a little bit more careful. I would say. Yeah. But you can see it. If you if you know you see it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Like, if you yeah. know you see it. And then it's that benevolent misogyny, misogynoir that you see. Oh, let me just help you, black girl. And yeah. You know, just And but, then also we're now so I mean, now seven years, that's like a whole new generation of people have come up. Yeah. Right? So now you gotta try to weed it out in the twenty somethings and Right. That was like still having to get their parents permission to log on yeah. to anything. Yeah. When I first said it, you know, we got 22 year olds who were 15 at the time, you know, trying to tell me because they just graduated about, yeah. oh, well, black girl magic isn't this and it isn't that like girl. Yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. you, baby. So let me tell you something, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. The young men who like grew up like listening to Joe Budden and his misogyny and all of that yeah. kind of stuff. And we're trying to be we're trying to have the same old colorism conversations. We're trying to have the same old misogynoir conversations with these little kids. Well, I shouldn't call right. them that. Young people. But young people. Yes. And it's, it can be exhausting, yeah. you know? It can really be exhausting. Like, child, we covered this. Yes, it is. We've covered this. I'll be, I'll be trying to be like, y'all just got to read some articles. Like, people have been writing these articles. People, I find it, and I'm sure you must find it um, frustrating when people especially young feminist women, black feminist women come to you like they invented the wheel. And I'm just like, y'all, All right. we've been talking about this for a long time. <laughs> like, All right. I'm glad that you're having these epiphanies and I'm, I'm glad that you did this tweet thread, but like we've been, mm-hmm. we've been doing this for a second. We've been doing yeah, it for a while. We covered this. Yes. Um, so what do you think about people kind of modifying black girl magic like i saw jennifer lopez wear a shirt that said bronx girl magic how do you feel about that it feels like like definitely bastardization especially from somebody like her who's pretty much like built a career off of copying us yep like i don't feel it yeah i don't feel it at all 
So no Latina like, girl magic, no Bronx girl magic, no. Like, no, let us have something. This yeah. is ours. Yeah, yeah. If you, I mean, I get it. I get that you want to latch on to something that's already, you know, popular. I get it that you feel a message or whatever, but go make your own. Yes, make your own stuff. Yes. Make your own stuff. I, I mean, I ain't mad at y'all because y'all love it because who wouldn't love it? Yeah. But go make your own stuff. Yeah. Be an innovator for your, for your girls. Because I, I, made, I did this for black girls. Yes. I didn't do this for nobody else. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Sorry, not sorry. Not sorry. Yeah. Um, so what do you, what would you like the, the legacy of black girl magic to be? I want the, I want the, uh, legacy to be that we always are and we always will be. Yeah. Like we always have been. You know, I didn't even come up with this like off of anything I had done. I came off it, came up with it off like memories and understandings of the women in my own family. I tell the story all the time about <clears throat> black girls on magic didn't start. <clears throat> excuse me for me in 2013. It started probably in 1977 when I was little and in in. My parents, like, my mom's favorite thing to do was tell us fairy tales, the once upon a time stories. And it was always got, you know, magicians and princesses and things that were, like, really, like, witches and water, um, like, Merlin and all that kind of stuff. Stuff you couldn't, like, really pin down Mm -hmm. as how these things happen, but they always happen. And so, you know, little kids, I teach little kids, little kids are very, very literal. And so if you think something is magic because of the way you heard it, it was the way, you know, then you look and you see your grandma take these ugly sweet potatoes and make like the best thing you ever had mm-hmm. in your life. You think that's magic. You know, you think that's magic. If you see, like I was five with my older cousin, who was probably like 11 at the time, taught me how to cornrow. I thought that was magic. Yeah. You know, I, my aunt, amazing storyteller to this day. She didn't like, my aunt was really young when all of us were born. All of us, you know, were born to young mothers. My aunt would go to the disco and then come back the next day and tell us about all what happened in the disco and show us the latest dance. I thought that was magic, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. Just to see her get dressed and get ready to look like this, to look like, you know, Walona Woods, yeah. I thought that was magic. Yeah, yeah. So I walked around inside my head for years as a little kid thinking black women were actually magic. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that, that was my understanding. Yeah, despite all of the other stuff, like, telling us that we are not magic. But see, but to see, the thing is, I didn't even grow up with that. Yeah. I didn't grow up with that at all. I didn't encounter, like, anti-black woman sentiment until I got to be an adult. Wow. I honestly, did, I did not, I went, I, look, D.C. was Chocolate City. I grew up in D.C. All my teachers were black. My neighborhood was black. My mayor was black. Uh, my mama, my daddy, my aunts and uncles, all of us, my cousins. I ain't know no white folks. I didn't have a white friend until I was 30. Mm. <laughs> so, I ain't, so I ain't know none of that. Uh, all I knew was black is beautiful. Because I grew up with like some semi-militant type parents. And, you know, they was like they was teenagers when we was born in the 70s. So they had latched on to that say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud stuff. And Afros and like all I knew was black everything, all black everything. So I didn't know nothing about people really don't like black women. What? Mm-hmm. And then to find out it was black men that didn't like black women. Mm. Oh, it was a shock to my system. Mm, that's so fascinating because like <laughs> the the internet, social media allows the black men who don't love black women to really find the, each other. And mm-hmm. create whole communities out of it. And first it was the Twitter communities, and now it's the YouTube. And like mm-hmm. they, they have squatted up. <laughs> they do. Yes. Yeah. And I, I didn't grow up knowing that. Mm-hmm. I knew nothing about that. Yeah, that's such a gift. Yeah. Yeah. And I know a lot of. I tell people all the time. I think it's <clears throat> very unique. Yeah. Very unique. And like only as an adult have I been able to look back and say. You know, some of the shit that, like, one of my uncles, he was raggedy as fuck um, to his wives. But even as a little kid, I knew he was wrong. But I didn't I didn't think that he was, like, I thought he was an, an anomaly, you yeah. know. From what I knew, black women were protected. We pro- were provided for. We were loved on. Like, my father treats my mother like a goddamn queen. Yeah. I, like a queen. And I had no problems, like expecting that in my own relationships 
Like, my mother and father have been together. I'm almost 47. My parents have been together 48 years. And I have never seen my mother carry a heavy bag in her life. Wow. I never. Like, never. Like, like what? <laughs> and she don't like she don't she knows how to drive, but she don't have to drive. She don't like driving. She's not a good driver. But my husband, my my father takes her everywhere. <clears throat> and so when I got with this husband right here, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. When I got with this husband right here, like I didn't have to tell him, you know, that my trash need to be taken care of out. You know, like I don't have to do none of that stuff. I'm a cherished woman. Right. Right. As a black woman, and that was always my experience. Yeah, yeah. But I see other black women just get, getting, oh my god, just yeah. horrible treatment, and it bothers me so much because what's preventing these men from treating these women the way that we should be treated? Yeah, you know. Yeah. So it's so that's interesting to me because it does feel like a lot of the black girl magic discussions are people reacting to or responding to whiteness or white supremacy and so it's like how do we balance like the knowing our inherent worth with always Mm -hmm. kind of trying to show up white folks and white supremacy and talking about black girl magic i don't think it should be any balance i think our entire focus should be on us Mm -hmm. like i don't look at white folk for the for the most part white people are like fringe peripheral players in my existence. Mm-hmm. I work in an all black organization. Like, black, let me tell you how black my executive director is. She's from Detroit. She in her 50s. She a Delta. <laughs> that's how black mm-hmm. my executive mm-hmm. director is. And that's our leadership. That's like pretty much re- representative of our leadership. We got one white lady that came a couple of months ago and she's like high up, but I don't know her. <laughs> Like, I don't know her. She ain't never been in my classroom. She never spoken in front of us at a professional development. Now, we we all black girls mm-hmm. for the most part. Like, my immediate supervisor is a Filipino woman. Yeah. But everybody black. All, yeah. all my coworkers black, Afro, Latina, black. Like, black. Yeah, yeah. And we might see the occasional white person in the building. Like, well, whatever. And then even when I, like, before I moved over here, across the line into Mount Rainier outside of D.C. Of course, when I was on my block, all black, all black, all black. But even moving to the so-called suburbs, because this is like two blocks away from D.C., so it's barely the suburbs, but we don't even have no white people really live on our block. Mm. <laughs> so I, don't, I mean, I see them, but I don't see them. So my focus is never on them or what they think about us or, you know, how they react to us. Like, look, I'm about black people, mm-hmm. black women, black girls first, you know, so... I don't think we should be focused in on whiteness or what white people do. We know we know what they are. Yeah. They don't wash their feet. They don't wash their hands. They always lashing on something that don't belong to them. We look. We know about white folks. Yeah. We because we had to to survive, right? right? They don't know about us. They ain't think about us. I'm not thinking. I'm honestly not thinking about white people. It's so. I think this is so important, though. I think it's so good to know that this kind of this phrase that is everywhere now really came from. Uh, a position of black women first, you know? Right. Yeah. So much of, so much of what we encounter as black women that is supposed to be quote unquote resistance is always in response to, or talking to, or outward facing. And I think that that makes the strength of black girl magic and black girls are magic so much more potent because it is inward facing. Right. It's about, I never was thinking about what was on the outside. Yeah. Because I never am. And I don't know if that makes me, like, bad or whatever. I don't know. Whatever. But I'm not thinking about the other. They the other. To me, my world is centered on blackness, black women. Not to say that the black men in my family aren't important to me. Of course they are. I have sons. I have a husband. My brother-in-law's right here. I have male cousins. My uncles. All of them are important to me. But they can get it, too, if they start acting up. This (laughs) This is about black women. Because when I think about America, I can't, the first, the first thought that comes into my mind is that it was built through our, through our bodies, literally. not just on our backs, mm-hmm. but literally through our bodies. Yep. Like we deserve everything we want. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. deserve everything. Yeah. And like, that's my focus. I'm never, ever centering anybody else but us. Yeah. Like, yeah. 
Do you think that there is something specific or particular about the way that black women congregate on social media and congregate on the Internet that made black girl magic really take off? Um, yes. The way that we mostly still just talk to each other for the most part. Right. Yeah. I mean, and it's not because we're not open to talking to other people, but we already know. Like, we had to know, we already know, intimately, we had to know how white folks operate for survival. Intimately, we had to know how men operate for survival. Ain't a whole lot they can tell us. Right. right. We already know. Yeah. 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 Like, no, nobody else is in that position to have to know the underbelly, the insides, the, you know, the roots, the branches, the trees of, you know, another existence just so you could survive. Like, white women ain't never really had to know nothing about us. Mm-hmm. And black men ain't really had to know a whole lot about well, White men definitely ain't paying us no mind until we come into service. So, ain't a, a whole lot they can tell us, but we had to know everything about them to mm-hmm. make it. There is something about, one, yeah, we are always talking to each other. But also, mm-hmm. like, the strength of that and the fact that we are known for innovation and known for setting mm-hmm. trends. And then other people want to see it and get us, like, it... This had all of the makings of being viral. It just did. Well, that's all I have, Kashan. Thank you so much. Is for that t- it? Yeah. Thank you for taking some time to talk to me. I appreciate it enormously. No problem. I'm so glad I finally got like to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I've been like a huge fan for years, like a huge fan of For Harriet, everything you do. Like I watch all your videos, your posts, your everything. Yeah, no, I definitely like people who have been on. I was trying to explain to somebody how long I've been on Twitter. And she was like, no, Twitter <laughs> wasn't even around in 2011. And I was like, yeah, it was. It, it totally was. Because I joined in 08. <laughs> yes, I was like, you you don't even understand. And so there is like a real crew of people who have really been going hard for black women on the Internet. And it's like, yeah. it's so interesting. And I am glad that Feminista Jones was able to write that book because I do feel like some of that early history of what black feminism was online and what it meant and the kind of backlash that you would get for taking up oh for God, black yeah. women. Like, that stuff, yeah. it's easy to forget. And I do feel like it could easily it be erased. Thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Leave a comment down below. Hit me up on Instagram or Twitter. Buy some merch. Sign up for the email newsletter. Shout out to the patrons. Shout out to the members. I appreciate y'all enormously. Patreon is where all of the bonus content goes. The exact same content goes to the members. That's where I get to be my freest self, to be honest. It's where I would say things that I would never say in public. So head on over there for the bonus content. I appreciate y'all enormously. Take care of yourselves. I'll see you next time. Bye.